So it's just coming up to three o'clock on Wednesday, the 15th of February, and we have with us Jono Tate. Jono, how are you keeping today? Yeah, I'm good, good. Having fun. Great stuff. And the big chief, the main man, the Arcala of the Alma Cafe, the salt shaker, shaking, mixing desk, Einstein looking top man, Mr. Richard Tate. Richard, how are you today? Are you in good form? Yeah, well, I'm here. Have you ever had an introduction like that before? Well, kind of, <laughs> but uh, that was fine. No, I'm, not going to, uh, I'm not going to take too much umbrage, and thank you very much for the invite. It's an absolute pleasure, Richard. Really, this is one of the conversations I've wanted to have from the very get-go of the podcast. When we first talked, Jono and I, to sit down with you as somebody, I think I've been coming here now for eight years or more, probably seen you every month or second month in that period. And the, the whole Amal Cafe, the vibe, is, is what's led us to put a series of conversations together. And this is one which, to me, is foundational for the Alma. My first question is to take you back to that period when you as the family Tate would have been sitting there talking about, we're going to acquire this, what would have been a cafe, mm-hmm. a, a, a corner shop in the heart of Rosebank in Cape Town. What brought you to that space? I've been working as a professional musician for many years and that up until that point, up until about 2004. And at that point, I'd become, I'd, basically, I was a bit cut full of it. I'd, I'd kind of had enough of being on the road. I also felt maybe I was starting to reach the end of my kind of sell-by date. Audiences were starting to look the same. All the songs were starting to sound the same. And I thought I need to change and that kind of stuff. And the opportunity to buy this place came up. And we thought when we bought it, we were going to get into a kind of street cafe, coffee shop, catering kind of, all that kind of stuff. It wasn't even on the radar at that stage to actually do a live music venue. That was just not on. In fact, I was actually pretty hot full and pissed off with music. I played for the first couple of years that we had this, had this venue. I played very little music, in fact. As a musician, you go through times where you, you actually hate yourself for ever having picked up an instrument or having sung a note. It might sound weird, but there's an ebb and flow to being a musician. And boy, was I ever on the ebb tide at that stage. And um, I just didn't want really anything to do with music or musicians or anything like that. And we were in a phase where the wife and I thought that we could actually get this place up and running as a little cafe, come street cafe, come taste kebab and all that kind of thing. And it didn't really work. And we found ourselves increasingly in the shit financially and with our backs against the wall, literally. In the interim, I'd been persuaded by a very close friend of mine, Graham Paddock is his name, to start playing again because Graham realized that I was, I was going through a bit of a dark night of the soul musically. He invited me to join him, him and a friend on a Tuesday evening at his place in Rondebosch, just get together with a couple of guitars and whatever songs he wanted to play and just play them. So I, I sort of slowly sort of tried to find myself again as a musician, find some direction or find some point or some purpose, some, some intensity, some, that love. It was a love lost. But it had to be, I had to find that again. I had to. I mean, I was aware of that. So it was a kind of, in a way, it was a bit desperate and a bit subterranean. But at the same time, there was also this need to, well, fucking hell, we've got to get something going in this place. And then the same friend of mine, Graham Paddock, God bless him, and I mean that, said to me, Richard, you've got lots of connections as a musician. You've been in the game a long time. Why don't you, why don't you try doing live music at the Alma Cafe? And my first reaction was, fuck off, I've had enough of live music. I'm really not interested. But then I kind of thought about it and, you know, we talked and Graham was a, he was a real friend because he knew that to push me was likely to cause an adverse kind of pushback. But he just, you know, we talked about it and we talked about it. Once again, to cut a long story short, I thank God I listened to him. And then him and myself and another mate of ours, Anton Kelly, with the three of us who'd been getting together at Graham's place, just, we decided, okay, let's, invite some friends around, give them a chow, clear a bit of space in the shop, play them some songs and see what they think. And that's what we did. And there was a very positive reaction to it. This is in about 2007, 2008, round about there. And to cut a long story short, we would get together and invite people around here maybe once a month or so and try it out. And 
it started to something something kind of I don't know unlocked I think in me or whatever and that yeah and I felt there's maybe an opportunity here maybe Graham is right let's try live music because at that stage we also had fuck all to lose in fact we were about to lose our either sell the shop or sell the house or sell everything because I mean we were fucked we were being nailed by ABSA at that stage uh, they wanted their money's worth by way of repayments which we couldn't pay back and the Alma Cafe as a live music venue was literally the last throw of the dice and at that point also some old friends of mine in the form of Neil Harvey in particular from Blacksmith. Neil heard that we were doing a bit of live music here. Neil and I go back 45, 50 years and that, way back into the mists of time. Neil heard that we were doing some stuff and he came around and he said, Listen, Blacksmith is looking for a venue. How's about it? So we thought, okay, cool, let's, let's give it a try. And to cut a very long story short, what started off as once a month with Graham and Anton and myself and then with the blacksmith lads coming and doing something, eventually became once a month, once a Sunday, once a week, twice a week, three times a week, and essentially is what we know the Alma Cafe to be some 15 years, 16 years later. It was something that was driven by need. It was driven by desperation. It was, as I say, the, frankly, the last throw of the dice for us if we were going to keep this venue. And also, the weird thing was is that when we started this thing, we, we, we sort of, okay, right, let, let's give this live music thing, let, 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 let's really give it, a, give it our best shot. And that's when I, I mentioned a little earlier in that, and I said to Rita, we're going to give this thing about six weeks, by which time I reckon we all know whether it's going to work Is this or going not. to be a going concern or not? Absolutely. Yeah. And within, I think, the first four or five weeks or so, because we did, we did a couple of weeks. We, we did, I think we were doing about you know, two, three gigs, I think two gigs a week at that stage then. We just thought, look, let's just book some friends and do some char, put some. In fact, we, we used to send a colander around. There was no admission on the door or anything like that. We had no liquor license. We had, no, we had fuck all. We didn't even have a PA here. We had no stage when we started. Just that we would stand up here with a couple of acoustic guitars and play and sing and, you know, do our thing and feed the people and they loved it. And it was very, it was, it, there was that kind of, it was so grassroots-ish. It was literally like, a, like the old juke joints in the, in, you know, in the South. You know, you get a bunch of people together that have a char, be a bit of booze or whatever and that kind of thing or whatever. And the lads would... All highlight and you know play a bit and that was really weird. Where hard hard stuff. There's a bit more to it than that, which is to say that that the, the family home was stripped of all of its tables and cutlery and glasses and you know we lived in an empty shell of a house for about two or three years. No, <laughs> yeah, well I mean we had fun money, we, so I mean we, we each had, had to bring plate. everything from home and use the home cutlery, the home tables, chairs, whatever, and it's that like kind of stuff. we all had a cup and, at home. You know, yeah. Um, yeah, we, 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 we each had our, our, our kind of cup and our, our mug and our saucer. And so that was kind of it, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it was something which we literally built from the ground up. What I didn't know is what a magic room this is. There's something amazing about the physicality of this room and its, its height, its width, its depth the resonance to the room. And when we put a stage in here, we knew that the stage was going to go where it's always been. That was always, we knew that. When we put the PA in there, an old mate of mine, Dave Williams, who was the sound guy, he was the senior sound guy at SABC in Seapoint. Dave and I came in and we put this old, and this old Dynacord of mine, that's a great PA. We knew the one cab was going to go into one corner, but the other one, we fucked around with it and eventually we found on that wall up there, was a good place for it. And it's just, a, it's a great room for sound. I could, I could not have designed a room better sound-wise, quite frankly. So we also had good sound in a good room going for us, which for me was very, very important as far as having a listening room is concerned. I also mentioned that I spent a lot of time in theatre. Okay, so when you put the room together, when you started to say formalise it, we're going to put chairs and tables and all this kind of cuck in or whatever and that kind of stuff. I knew, okay, what we're going to do is this is going to be a listening to music venue. This is going to be a case of Richard says, shut the fuck up and listen. Okay, not in a fascist <laughs> way or like shotgun to your head, but if you want to listen to way me. in a courtesy to the artists, right? Yeah. 
It's it about is. respect to the music, respect to the sing of the song, respect to the audience, and respect to the musicians performing. It's all about respect in that way and listening because music, as I said earlier, it's all about listening. So we had John Ellis here earlier and we were talking about, well, he was saying that, you know, the Alma has developed this kind of reputation in and around the country, really, for people want to play here because, well, I don't know, because it's just become something of an institution, I suppose, by value of having stuck it out. I suspect very strongly, and I know this from my own experience, a large part of that from the musician's point of view is the sound. Because it's not often that you get to play in a venue that's small enough that you're effectively playing to your own. You hear, well, it's you playing to your own front of house. But what that means as a musician is that you're sitting on this stage listening to exactly the same thing that you know everyone in the room's hearing. That's very unusual. Most musicians are, you know, we're used to stages where you have speakers on stage. The monitors or any other. Yeah. 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 And you generally get a nasty sound out of those things, particularly in a country like South Africa where the industry is not what we'd all love it to be, which is top flight all the time. So sometimes you in very compromised situations as an artist having to deal with difficult sound. Whereas you walk into Alma and you pretty much feel like you're playing acoustically in a rehearsal room that's just slightly amplified by then it just so happens that when my dad back in the 80s invested in PA gear bought a really high-end PA and that's meant that we've been able to fall back on the fact that our sound is very high quality since forever and it's it's one of the it's one of the chief things that makes musicians who haven't played here they don't know why they want to play here, but they come here and they go, oh, that makes sense. And the ones who come back and back and back, it's like, well, it's the best sound in Cape Town and we like playing it because it's fun. It's nice. It's a good gig to play. It's an important point you're making there because now I think about it, you know, typically your touring band has to bring their kit and everything with the armor. It's purpose made for you to rock up with the guitar of your choice and anything ac- accessories that you Some want. Of the back but you, and that's it, but yeah. you plug in and yeah, away you see, you Yeah, that for me is, is something which... I cannot and have never have never been willing to compromise on because for me it's all about the once again it comes back to the listening and if you've got great sound you as a musician are going to you as a musician are going to play better because you can hear what sure. you're doing it's a nuance anyone can get 90 percent it's the last 10 percent that makes all the fucking difference where I come from you see it's the tail of that reverb that goes whatever the case might be. It's stuff that maybe I hear or that people don't even know they're hearing, but until you suddenly take it out. Sure. And then, oh, okay. It's the spaces between the notes also when it's quiet. So we set the room up because of my theatrical background, musical theatre and that kind of stuff. We set the room up also in such a way that the focus is naturally, must go naturally towards the stage, okay, towards where the performance is coming from. So you've got the performance coming out here to the audience who are, focusing in on the stage. You've got the quietness of the room. You've got the beauty of the ambience of the room. You've got the intimacy of the room. You've got great sound. You've got the energy of a group of people in the audience who are there for the same purpose. Right. You've got a unity and everything happens. It comes together. I've described that at times as we've got the stage here, what's coming off the stage in the audience here, and we meet and we dance in the lights. That's how it is. Just on the, the people sit down and shut up, there's a very good anecdote that I haven't heard for a year or two about that young lady. Oh, yeah, there was a young I don't know woman. if we're going to be able to pass this one, but it's no, worth fact telling. That. It's we can. a great I can. story. I, I, I can tell it. There was a young woman who came along here one night and she performed and she was wearing a leather jacket. And at some stage during the, the performance, she literally, it was like a reveal, hey? She literally unzipped the jacket in one moment and flung it open. I thought, oh, my God, this woman's got nothing on underneath. But she didn't. She had a T-shirt on which says, Richard says, shut the fuck up and listen. (laughs) (laughs) And it was absolutely, it was one of the, it was a a standout moment, uh, you know. And she couldn't have been more than about 22, which was, I just thought it was just, you know, it was was just a wonderful, a a very magical moment. uh, Let's put it that way. Because, again, it's, People don't know what it means to listen very often. They've never really heard. And when they come to a place like this and they're listening to something to a formal, to people whose, whose music they really enjoy, 
and they're hearing it to a high level of performance and, in a sense, live production. The performances, the growth of the Alma since 2007 and 8, that's basically 15, 16 years on. You've talked about the inception, but then also the idea that it's become, I think, John, you described it as an institution. I certainly would describe it as an institution for live music. How do you recognize the sort of that progress? Or is it something that just through hard work, hard effort, build, build, build your client base and your audience, the type of audience, as well as the type of guests who would appreciate it? We had to put a lot of things in place, and a lot of it is just sheer fucking hard work, yeah. you know. Um, and I'm not one of those who kind of reflects terribly on, you know, so much what we've achieved or was we maybe built a brand or that we built something which is quite unique or quite special because I'm, I'm concerned about the next gig. It's up to other people for me to recognize that kind of identity, maybe. I'm very grateful for the fact that we are still here after all the years that we're doing it, that we've managed to still keep it, you know, keep it going and, and somehow keep it fresh, or at least through all the COVID stuff and God knows whatever. But it's something which, which I leave for others to make their determinations. I'm not, I'm not really interested in the, in the rah-rah of it, quite frankly. If we take the state of live music in South Africa right now and the amount of venues that are around and available to either established or up-and-coming artists, what would the scene look like if places like the Alma were not here? And how important is it for the live music scene in Cape Town that there are places like this to come to? Well, I think it's a fucking tragedy that there's so few good venues around. It's not as if having a good venue is rocket science. You just got to be prepared to work fucking hard, be consistent, be committed, and maintain a level of, of, of enduring decent quality and make sure that you are also treating those who are performing and those who are paying in the way in which you would like to be treated, and that's with respect. There's a vast amount of respect involved where I come from, which I which I and I make a point of saying to my audiences or to our audiences every night, thank you for being here. We could not do this if you did not support us. And I don't care how many times I say it, I mean it every fucking time. And I also am equally aware of critical and ongoing support on the part of, of the performers and the muses. I just wish there were a lot more venues because for me the saddest fucking thing is is that there are so many really talented musicians in this country, in this town, and they can hardly scrape a fucking living together because of lack of decent venues and audiences which are willing to support them as well. Because well, that's I the other thing. I, this is something I've experienced while having the, the ability to have toured around the country a little bit and played a little bit of music myself and seeing what is it that makes venues tick. And quite frankly, there's something that my parents have in common with the other venues around that I've been to. And, and these are venues like, I think back to what used to be Cafe Rue in town, a yep. husband and wife team, and yep. Mike and Vanessa running the place. The Carew Saloon, where Marius and his wife run the place. There's uh, at the courtyard, Art and McGregor, which is uh, Steve yep. and Doing Meg, some good work out there. Very, who, very who are nice. making it work. There's Café Ruin Nurtuk, which... Café Ruin Nurtuk is an interesting place because Lindy, who, who owns and runs the place, is still very hands-on, but has managed to get a restaurant business model working there just enough that she can be a little bit more hands-off than all the rest of those that I, that I mentioned. But what I recognize in common with venues that seem to go the distance and with what we're doing here is that it seems to take a husband and a wife who are willing to sacrifice their lives to the good of live music because it's a it's a passion i, I don't it's it's either a matter of and I, i'm sure you can weigh in here desperation passion or a sense of this giving giving your life the meaning that that, that i think no, we're absolutely all looking for, you, you know? know and i mean i must not let all the shit that's going on in this fucking world and in this fucking country stop me doing the one thing that really has profound purpose and meaning for me. Not a fuck. No ways. In that sense, I will, I will be the guy who decides how much longer or when to say, okay, right, I've now had enough and that kind of thing. Because again, I've tried to leave music God knows how many times. 
keeps, pu- keeps pulling you back. Absolutely. So you make your piece of it and then you get on with it. And here we are. If you think of all the nights that you've sat behind the mix desk here, Richard, I'm guessing you're into thousands, literally Careful. thousands of nights. The same question I asked Jono in the first episode that we recorded together. Which of the nights that stand out for you? That was different. That was special. As a musician or because you were surprised by what you saw or just it blew the roof off? You were very excited when Annie Lennox was here. No, but that was more. Um, yeah, but that was more having a conversation with her. Just sort of said what a, you know. She was just very complimentary about the place and what you were doing and how he did it and that kind of stuff. Again, the recognition from a real pro who's worked at a very high level. That was very cool, no doubt about it. If there was one performance that I really that I will kind of treasure, and it goes to my sense of spontaneity and magic in the moment, was when the late Pit Buerto arrived here one night to do a gig with his mate, Jake Gunn. And Pitt asked me if the Martin brothers who were in town doing a gig, if they could join Pitt and Jake because their gig and I think Art and Bloberg, I think, had fallen through. And I said, oh, Pitt, of course. Those guys got up there and it was just something absolutely magical. None of them were like the kind of the world's most unbelievable musicians playing the best songs that have ever been sung or whatever. But there was just somehow, there was a magic and a spontaneity and a, and a joy. And also just watching Pitt, how Pitt kind of just exercised, a, it was almost like ran a master class in getting this one to play that song and come now, Jakey, come now, spiel on Sna and whatever that it was just it, it, it was magical and these are and these are let it be said Jonathan Martin Aidan Martin and Jack Gunn are some rude and rough boys as well they love their good they do a, great, <laughs> they do a fucking great Stones tribute as yeah. well which is another great gig Jonathan's band Hatchet Man they've had some moments yeah. whereby there have been some moments here and there where where it's been just pure magic as far as the combination of those voices the harmony the venue, the sound, whatever, and that kind of thing. And I thought, fuck, I wish I could make it last forever. But, you know, the, one of the things I love about live music is that it is gone as it's created. And it remains a memory, and a memory is, God knows, a faulty thing at best. To remember that which is so ephemeral, it's, so, it's literally so transitory, it hardly occupies a present. It's waiting to happen, it happens, and it's gone. I'm going to put you on the spot here, Richard. As a parent, what does it mean when you see your son up there performing either as a co-performer through the shambles, for example, or just, as you say, with his band Hatchet Man or Solo? What do you think when you see Jono up there playing? What does it make you feel like? When I can see that he's in a good space and he's, he's at one with himself and with what he's doing, I know what that's like. It's priceless. Absolutely fucking priceless. It's that ultimate Zen moment, if you'll excuse the Zen of well, whatever, because I've been there myself and I can experience it vicariously because I, I know what it's like and I've shared it. And to see that in my son, when he has those moments, those are the moments which make all the other shit worth it. You know, it's the moments that we live for. It's like what uh, Janice Joplin said years ago, you know, that the hour on stage when the magic happens is what I've spent my whole life waiting for. Fantastic. And that is the hope when you get up there and you do it, that you're going to have some of those magic moments. They're not guaranteed. They're often few and far between, but they are there to be had. It keeps most of us who really care about what we do still doing it as well. I don't know if this was before your time as, as a customer here, Pete, but we used to have a band called For Folk's Sake back in the day. That was the first Alma Cafe house band, okay, For Folk's so Sake. Shambles is, yes, shambles is just a shambles long line is of traditions. Like, yeah, this is the new, this is the new <laughs> one. So, um, yeah, Dad came up with that one, and that was, that was my schooling. Nice. You know, I think, fuck, what was I, 16 or 17 when we started that? Yeah. I did a lot of the big rock shows right. way back in the 90s, right. and, that, and a friend of mine and myself, Dan Swart, we kind of formed the, the older two in the band and then Jonathan had a mate of his, Gareth. 
Yeah. And they were obviously the youngsters, so we had the four of us. And we got we got schooled. We got Probably we not. got we well, it was just a case of like, listen, if you want to play music, there's a fucking standard that exists. And it was certainly for the way I've approached music ever since, it's like I can count on maybe two hands being dropped by equipment or forgetting a microphone. Because when I was eighteen years old, I played in a band with my dad and God help me if I didn't have my shit together. And um, we had a lot a of fun. Phrase, little phrase that had its uh, d- 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 in the Tate House and it went like this. It has to do with attention to detail. So we had a good time doing that and that certainly learned me a thing or two. And that was an immensely popular band, I think. And, and not just because we played songs and music that people like to listen to, but also because I think people thoroughly enjoyed and I know that it's still the case today when we play with the shambles or occasionally so so the shows that we do when dad gets involved there's so there's for folks sake back in the day which was incredibly popular it was a case of put it out and bang sold out then we also do a Neil Young and Bob Dylan sort of tribute with my dad's very good friend and one of my three godfathers Bill Knight <coughs> which who also is, runs a, who also runs a live music venue down in Fisher called the Cottage Club that's yep. Bill, yeah. And uh, so we do that, which is also a very sort of spur of the pants and heat of the moment kind of situation. <laughs> and that one tends to do very well as well. And then the shambles, people seem to really like the shambles. And my personal feeling on it, and Dad, you're probably going to feel a bit embarrassed, but I know that the, the, the commentary I get after those gigs is, hell, it's so nice to watch Richard on stage doing what he clearly yeah, loves. definitely. For me, sitting on, you know, being part of the whole thing, like, it's so lekker seeing the old man get up and do what he likes doing as well. Every now and again, I can imagine sitting behind the sound desk. I've done it once or twice. Sometimes I sit there and I get really inspired by the music and I'm like, God damn it, I wish I was fucking playing right now. You know, and my dad's been doing that for 13 years. To watch him get on stage and in the same way you know as as you speak about recognizing me having moments where i'm really enjoying it to watch you like really dig in and have a great time playing songs that you love that's fantastic and i think and i think the audience the people who we've gotten to know around here and have kind of gotten to know us a little bit and, and love what we're doing for them, it's such a treat getting to see like the boss of a place get up and rock the joint. Look, the, you know? the, 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 the other thing is, is that, I mean, I've been doing, I'm 66 years old now, okay? And when you, you know, up until you, even in your mid-40s, or whatever, you're fucking immortal. You know, you've got this rock and roll bullshit in your head and you're cool and you're strong and this kind of thing. And then, then you start getting, you start realizing that actually life is very fragile. There's very, very little which is guaranteed. And as I've gotten older... I approach the gig from a point of view of, thank you, God, that I can do this. Thank you that I still have enough voice left, that I still have enough energy, and that I can still do it to a reasonable standard. And that, that for me, then becomes, it becomes something which I can share. It becomes a form of a prayer. It's a form of meditation. It's a form of thanksgiving. It's a form of community. It's a form of expressing joy and gratitude with those who I'm working with to those and towards those for whom I am playing. I'm not being precious. I hope to God I'm not being precious about it in that like kind of anal sense, but that there's a gratitude and that in a sense, man, after all these years, I can still do this and fuck, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm really glad that I can and that I still love doing it. The passion is still there. Well, Richard, I hope there's many, many more years to come. And I say there, whether it's behind the desk or on the stage, again, from, from my side, thank you for what you do for live music. Thank you for providing us with a place to come at a weekend. And may it continue for many, many more years in whichever shape or form. But thank you. And thanks for your time this afternoon. I know how busy you are. We've seen it's a busy place, even on an afternoon where you're trying, trying to get through. Thank you, and all the very best for the future. Jono, any words from your side before we wrap? Yeah, I suppose, actually, I do. Um, I think it's probably worth committing committing this to, to some f- sort of form of history. Dad, thank you. Thank you for giving me a life. Well, thanks for being part of it. And also, you know, to you guys as well, Peter, for, for doing this and for having the passion and the sense of community as well, because this is what it's about, is that there's something common in this, to this, and for 
for this, for all of us. It's not just to me, myself, and I think. Thank God. There's a real sense of shared community. And that, for me, is the greatest gift that music has given me. It's given me a life that I otherwise could not have, I could not have dreamed. I have had the people I've met, the places, the things, the experiences. I have so much to be grateful for. Well, thank you for sharing it with us. Genuinely. All the best, Richard. Thank Good you, luck bro. for the rest of the year. Hey, we rock and roll, but I like it. <laughs> thank you, brother. Lovely Please stuff. Do. Thanks. Every now and again, someone writes what can only be best be described, as far as I'm concerned, as a, as a perfect song. Um, I think this song is, is one of those. It's, it, it's, the, it's the title track of, uh, of the album Wild Flowers. And uh, I think it's also a song for love lost, love rejected, love unrequited, love kicked in the head, love fucked up. Any kind of love that you can kind of think of that has sustained and that has gone wrong but still somehow endures. So uh, this is that song. It's a wish. Maybe even a prayer.
Grazie a te, Lamberto.